Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have more of a technology slant to the conversation with Genesis hosting us today. Insurance, like many industries, is heavily dependent on systems and architecture, whether that be for claims, finance, or distribution with outsource and binder functions heavily dependent on robust systems to enable those mandates. There is no doubt that FinTech, in today's case more specifically InsureTech, is becoming more and more important. For those whose first time it is on our Digital Insights, be sure to secure your CPD certificate from the IIG CPD vault found on our website. Should you have any queries, please reach out to us on email info at iig.co.za. Please remember to engage with us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. If you have not already connected to our social pages, do so now. And remember our hashtag this year is hashtag insuring tomorrow. Look out on our social platforms too for some events that will be advertised following the easing of restrictions as per the president's office uh, last, last week. I'd like to also thank Daphne Peter, our Head of Education uh, Portfolio within the IIG, and her team, Sampiwe, Asia, and Keshri, who make these events possible, along with the support of Salomi and Mpo from the IIG office. Again, look out for further insight sessions that we've also lined up for the rest of the year. What would a technology session be without a joke or two prior? I was recently told about three database administrators who walked into a SQL bar. A little later, they walked out. I believe it's because they couldn't find a table. I guess what's even more intriguing is the fact that they went out at all and didn't stay at home consuming screenshots. Um, before uh, Genesis blacklist me for my corny IT jokes, I'd like to welcome Craig Ullefier from Genesis, who will lead us on a conversation in making sense of InsureTech with the what's and the why's being answered. Also, please make use of the Q&A functionality, which will be answered at the end of the session. A little about Craig Ullefier, he has been at the heart of Genesis for over 20 years and was part of the original team that started the development of Sky. After finishing his studies in software design, he joined Genesis, where he quickly climbed the ranks to become the youngest director in the company. He started his career at Genesis as a developer and subsequently headed up the development team before moving into a more client-facing role where he was appointed as sales director. In 2018, Craig was responsible for opening up the first international Genesis branch in London, where he assumed the role of vice president of technical. In 2020, Craig was appointed as the chief technical officer for both the SA and the international businesses. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Craig Ullefier. Craig, thank you, welcome, and over to you. Thank you, Daryl. I was gonna do my own intro, but I think you did a perfect job of that. Is my screen sharing? Correct, we can see it. Excellent. All right, so, so good morning, everyone. Um, great to be part of this webinar today. Um, thanks, thank you all for attending. And thanks, Daryl and the IRG, I guess, for facilitating uh, the discussion today. And it, as you said, I think it is a bit more of a, a technical discussion. Um, Daryl has introed me, but I think what maybe one of the points I do want to make is that, uh, you know, a lot of my time over the years at Genesis have been very much, uh, my primary role has been, a, you know, managing the product from a technical perspective. And I think importantly, that included reinvesting a lot back into the platform to further provide and integrate new technology, um, providing our customers with, with additional, uh, additional benefits. Um, and I guess what, what we do really well and what we believe we do well is provide the backend platforms, but provide, um, value in creating ecosystems. And I think that's what I really want to talk a lot about today is creating ecosystems of value, but leveraging your core insurance uh, backend throughout the insurance value chain. So I'm really passionate about InsureTech and the innovation and disruption it's bringing to, to our sector. Uh, I believe many of the current insurance products sold today um, were invented um, quite a few years ago. And I think at, at this point, it's really ripe for disruption um, and looking to disrupt product offerings out there and deliver them in, in different ways. Um, so I think if we, as we stand today, um, Amazon was founded 26 years ago. The invent and the first iPhone was 13 years ago. And I think that's really for uh, causing the insurance industry to, 
to kind of sit up and take notice and to start looking at what do we do to further innovate. Um, so I'd like to spend some time today sharing my views on InsureTech, um, how it will continue, continue to disrupt the insurance sector. And what I'll do is then cover the what. Um, so what is InsureTech and, and how does it affect uh, the insurance sector? The why, why do we need it? And then I think importantly, the how, how do we go about actually implementing it within our businesses? And then as, as Daryl said, we'll take some questions towards the end um, and hopefully we can, we can answer some of those. So if I move straight in, so what is InsureTech? Um, so, so for me, it's the ability to leverage innovative technologies and digital tools to optimize the performance of insurance companies. I think ultimately at the end of the day, providing customers with a better product offering, with a better experience, um, and streamlining administration overhead so that insurance companies can provide this innovation at essentially a reduced cost. So it's the ability, I guess in layman's terms, the ability to make use of new technology uh, to better insurance in its various different forms. So I guess a high level definition of InsureTech. If we, if we look at the market, and I guess just some stats, um, I think from the, the numbers you can see on the screen, I'm sure you can see the benefit of, of adopting InsureTech and based on the intro, but globally, the, the InsureTech market and the adoption has been increasing exponentially over the last 10 years. Um, last year, there was $6 billion worth of investment and it's expected to double by 2025 to, to just over 10 billion US um, from a revenue perspective. So that translates to a 10.8% compound annual growth rate. So these numbers, I guess, clearly indicate the value InsureTech is creating globally within the sector um, across new ideas, you know, incumbents looking to innovate their own offerings and much more around personalized insurance covers. Um, so it's yet to stay. And I think, uh, I think the numbers show that. Um, my, my next slide, I think, delves a little bit deeper into the, the, the actual spend um, since 2014 um, and raisings that in, InsurTex have managed to achieve um, as, you know, through all of their different stages from a deal count perspective along the bottom and then actual revenue split between uh, property and casualty and, and life insurance. So as we said, $6 billion worth of uh, investment in 2019. And you can see by the graph, there's a, a clear steady growth year on year which translates into the, these various different acquisitions and funding rounds um, that gets reflected uh, in the graph. So insurance companies need to look outside of the internal innovation and organic growth um, to increase the market share. And, you know, I think a lot of, um, it, it's difficult to onboard a new customer if you're not doing something different to, to what's out there. So innovation does require an, an internal culture, which is, for me, what my view is it's not often forthcoming in a lot of the um, insurance companies. So often this innovation comes from outside the industry and it requires almost fresh eyes looking at problems or opportunities using technology um, and, you know, understanding these, these opportunities and then solving them with the right technology to make the required change that's expected. One of the key things for me is um, what, what I've seen a lot in the industry is that people almost want to use technology for the sake of using technology. And there's, there's a lot of buzzwords out there, blockchain as an example, artificial intelligence. Um, and I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that in my presentation. But I think that the key thing for me is that we use the right technology for the right uh, business requirement and be able to measure that. So don't use technology for the sake of it but use it in the correct form. Um, and <clears throat> real value comes from a collaborative approach. Um, and I'll talk quite a bit about it, but the ability to create ecosystems of value across the, the insurance value chain. 
So I, I included this slide. I, I actually gave a, a, a talk on InsureTech some, some years back, and I, I spent quite a bit of time talking through the hype versus impact of different technologies out there. Um, so this is the updated uh, Gartner slide, which showcases the, the hype cycle. Um, so essentially technologies emerge based on an innovative trigger, which is the left-hand uh, left block. And they get explored further. Um, they, they get understood on how they can add different value to different industries, including insurance. And then plotted over an expectations graph as well as a time graph. Um, and then looking at what is, is, is their potential just inflated expectations? Um, and then do they just wash out over time? And what you often find with this hype cycle graph is that a lot of technologies jump up the, the, the hype curve and then very quickly they, they kind of peter out because they don't add much value. And then you get a lot that then follow and actually add a lot of value down the line. So looking at the, the hype cycle graph from Gartner, I think the, the, the key things for me that stand out um, in InsureTech and how it's disrupting the industry at the moment is firstly big data. Um, and I think a lot of you may have heard, you know, big data is, or, or data is almost the new oil, being able to understand more about what's happening out there and accessing various different data points. And the ability to understand risk um, and ability to mitigate it or even underwrite it differently. And this includes things like social data, um, what are consumers doing out there, what excites them, what doesn't excite them, buying behavior. Um, and we actually recently had a, uh, we did some work with a, a, a UK based customer that was wanting to leverage challenger bank integration. So as a customer purchases a, a, an airline ticket, potentially at that point, if you can hook into that data point, offer him travel insurance right there and then. So those are the kinds of use cases that it facilitates. Um, again, I think in the medical space, medical information has really skyrocketed, being able to understand a lot more about lives out there in the medical and the life space. And then I think, uh, yeah, I think the second key point for me is around artificial intelligence. And you'll see on, on this slide, AI is mentioned in quite a few different areas in different contexts. But artificial intelligence and machine learning really does provide the ability to utilize a lot of computer power behind the scenes um, and leverage a lot of that deep learning to understand that big data and be able to make positive decisions from that. The, the third key point for me is IoT devices, which is um, Internet of Things. Um, and really what, what those sensors allow you to do is to understand more about your risk. So the ability to be able to um, track things like potential flooding in areas, uh, uh, measure things like faulty geysers or boilers, um, even on the health side, wearables like iWatches and Fitbits to be able to understand your risk in, the, in, in, in more detail with the ability to mitigate. Um, Another, I think, good, good use case there is in agriculture to be able to understand if crops should be um, failing and be able to pay claims automatically, that, that kind of thing. And then I think the fourth key point that I took away from the slide is uh, claims fraud management. And, you know, I think in, in the insurance industry, there's a lot of, of fraud and it's about the ability to be able to identify that and make decisions based on that. Um, so if you can have a view on how customers connect, what different suppliers they're using, are there any red flags from a fraud perspective, be able to mitigate that, um, which at the end of the day then very much drives down um, loss ratios, it drives down the total cost to, to ensure. So yeah, I think, I think for me, the hype cycle versus actual impact of change um, is really important. I, uh, maybe another good example is you know, blockchain has been a, a, a buzzword around. Um, and I think blockchain can add a lot of value in the insurance sector, but it's about directing it to the correct space. Um, and if, and I'll talk a bit about it later, but I think if you can start connecting insurers with reinsurers in a distributed ledger, it makes a lot of sense. So if I then move on, I, I also do believe that innovation needs to happen across the insurance value chain. 
Um, so I don't think that InsureTech plays across the whole space, but it targets certain key areas um, within these ecosystems. And I think this, this slide just talks nicely about different logos playing in different areas, but you've got key areas of awareness, being able to understand um, the product. And I often refer to it as the micro moment. Um, and I think some good examples here is if you at an airport and uh, your, your suitcase or your bag goes off on the conveyor belt, um, as that as your suitcase goes off, if you've got a pop up on your phone to go, you, you, you can insure your luggage or you can insure uh, purchase travel insurance, you're much more likely to get a purchase at that point, rather than trying to before the, the, the trip or after the trip, try and sell that cover. So the, the micro moment for me is important around awareness and providing um, the correct insurance offerings at the correct time. I think the other bit is around choice. Um, and we've seen in the UK, um, lots of personal lines, retail insurance has all gone back to the aggregator space. And it's very much price driven, which, um, you know, technologies that, that, that support that. But I think it's about being able to provide personalized insurance to consumers or prospective consumers based on the life stage that they're in at the time. Um, so being able to understand where they're at, what what they what type of cover they're needing, and then um, you know kind of prompt them to purchase the correct the correct insurance. Then I think there's also a lot of um, capabilities that should be looked at around purchase behavior and being able to make it easy for customers to buy. So this often ties to bundling insurance with other products. And I think a, a simple example is if you are buying something on take a lot that you can actually insure it right there and then um, to try and streamline that, that purchase space, as well as also how you pay. So from a, a payment gateway type integration, um, allowing customers to pay in various different, different manners. And then I think a lot of the use bits is around um, providing additional efficiency in the administration space um, so that customers can firstly get um, documentation automatically, let, let systems drive that, um, enabling digital channels where customers can log on 24 seven, engage with you as an insurer or a, an insurance channel. Um, Omnichannel I think is really important because depending on the product, um, being able to talk to someone if you really want to, but the ability to engage digitally or via chatbots. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity around um, setting up the, the omnichannel approach. And then self-service, again, allowing customers from a, in a very transparent way to be able to interact with, with your organization. So I guess in summary, InsureTechs target specific points in the user journey which streamlines the process and facilitates sales and, and innovation. So yeah, I think hopefully that, that showcases uh, different key areas. So I've got a quick video which I'll play um, and then we can, I'll talk to that afterwards. The insurance in the industry is undergoing a perfect storm. Changing customer demands, advances in technology, increases in data, the impact of natural disasters, shifting demographics and evolving regulations are just some of the factors combining to shake the industry to its roots. Customers want more from their insurance. Whether businesses, consumers or businesses offering services to consumers, they all now expect the speed and elegance of digital retail conducting business when they want, where they want, using the channel of their choice. And customers are increasingly savvy and able to compare offerings and prices with the competition in an instant. Technology is creating a wealth of new possibilities. The advent of big data creates opportunities for insurers to make use of unprecedented insights into their end customer's life, property, health, wealth, and behavioral patterns. Advances in artificial intelligence are allowing insurers to sift through this data quickly and efficiently, enabling more personalized approaches to risk management, <laughs> reduced liabilities, and lower premiums in return. The ability to access data faster than ever before 
also allows insurers to settle claims more quickly. What used to take weeks and months is now happening in days or hours. In the past, a common strategy for insurance players was to wait for the competition to move first in order to see if a new direction was successful or not. But that strategy doesn't work in this disruptive environment with new competitors from outside the insurance space. All these changes have given rise to new players with new ways of working and competitive business models. By the time you decide to move, it may be too late. So, as insurers look towards a very different market in the future, how can they navigate change and achieve success? In this environment, it's important to learn fast and if you fail, fail quickly so you can learn your lesson and move on. Established players must find ways to be more versatile, to think like a disruptor and act like a startup, while all the time maintaining a clear focus on the customer. In times of rapid change, it's hard for executives to separate fact from fiction, easy to be seduced by the latest trend and tempting to be drawn into blindly copying what the competition is doing. But following the crowd is not the answer. The most successful companies across industries understand that they have to build a strong and distinctive identity that allows them to carve out their own market position rather than reacting to a market that has been created by others. Creating such a strong identity means that you must be very clear about the way you will add value to your customers in the future, your way to play, and also very focused on building the few differentiating capabilities that will allow you to deliver that value better than anyone else. Once you know which capabilities your organization needs to excel at, you can then develop a capability <coughs> agenda to take you from where you are today to where you need to be tomorrow. It's important to consider how quickly you can build these new capabilities and by when you will need them to be mature and integrated. Should you build them organically? Should you acquire them through m and Or should you partner with other players? Being very clear about the specific capabilities you need to excel at allows you to focus your entire organization on what truly matters to your customers and build a powerful engine of growth. Disruption is here to stay, and not everyone will succeed. It is the players who have the courage to commit to an identity based on what truly differentiates them who will have the opportunity to shape the insurance industry of the future. So I, I think one of the key takeaways for me from that video and uh, is, is that it, it, it really does incite full view on the insurtechs and how companies should go about implementing strategies to enable innovation and disruption. The other thing I think that really strikes as well is that customers are forcing us to, to change. So customers are, ch are driving the change from a personalized options perspective. Um, I think there is very much then the first mover advantage, being able to do things um, uh, quickly and upfront and, and not have not follow uh, competitors. The ability to fail fast um, and to pivot if um, the, the, the value proposition needs to change and agility, being able to do it in a, in a very agile manner. But I think probably the most important is to define a plan and drive it internally within your business to actually make these, make these changes. So I guess then moving to, I think we've covered the, what is InsurTech? Um, if we now move to why do you need it? So, you know, we've spoken a lot about um, the value it adds. So why do we need to adopt it? So from a, an insurance industry perspective, it's, we, we got, we're undergoing a profound transformation. Um, we continue to drive that growth and, and profitability, but uh, I think however, the a tr a traditional approach to how we currently sell products is not enough. We, we need to take that further. We need to concentrate on self-service based models. Uh, we need to look at the ability to innovate products. Um, you know, even I think today we're insuring products that we didn't insure uh, or, or we're insuring risks we didn't insure uh, five years ago. So looking at defining these innovative product capabilities. Um, and I, I think one of the most important things for me is the ability to look at actually providing technology or leveraging technology to mitigate risk. 
So that's obviously ideal from a consumer and a policyholder perspective, as well as the insurer and the reinsurer. And uh, I more recently had the unfortunate experience of having a geezer burst in, in my home. And, you know, it's one thing going, uh, Mr. Insurer, please come and replace my geezer. But the geezer burst, there was a whole lot of resultant damage, damaging my ceilings, damaging the kitchen and cleaning the house. So, you know, at the end of the day, if, if we can use technology to mitigate that risk so that the geezer doesn't actually burst, that's obviously in everybody's best, best interest. And I, you know, I, think, I think that's the approach we should look at around um, how do we innovate the products using technology like sensors on, on a geezer or telematics devices in vehicles. So, and I do think then that this is all driven based on um, consumer demands. Also, I think the generations we selling to, so we selling to different generations that want to engage differently. And I, I think finally driving the change um, to create efficiencies from an administration perspective to reduce the cost of being able to provide all this capability. And that's leveraging things like ability to outsource, um, ability to, to access data, leverage the cloud. So I think there's lots of, lots of real opportunities around that. And I think further to, to this slide, I think there's also the ability to leverage a lot of technologies out there like I've spoken um, in some of the previous slides. So um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, ability to digitalize um, customer self-service and then product, product disruption. So uh, I believe insurers spends today is shifting from funding the existing business to actually funding innovation rather than the, the traditional spend. So I think if we take the why slightly further, um, the strategic innovation should be viewed through a lens of almost balancing the trade-offs between time, money, autonomy, and differentiation. Um, and the, the snippet or diagram I, I took out of the latest Capgemini um, InsureTech report, and I think they summed it up quite nicely, showcasing that there's three key areas of evolution within the, the product offering as well as the consumer space. So from a risk lands, landscape perspective, there's a lot of evolution. I think from a disruptive environmental patterns, if we talk about weather, uh, if we talk about <clears throat> new medical and health concerns, I think COVID found us in that situation globally where all of a sudden we had to deal with things that we had never planned on doing before. Um, and then very much evolving social and demographic trends. Um, so I think from the risk perspective, I think it's a given, it's changing. I think from the business dynamics perspective, um, customer preferences are changing. They're wanting to engage differently. They, we're looking for new business models. And I think also we, we, we've seen a lot of bundling of offerings where, like I mentioned, um, buying on take a lot and insuring or Amazon. But I think more recently, Tesla has started bundling insurance with their product. So it becomes actually product uh, providers bundling insurance. So it, 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 there's definitely, I think, a, ch a change and a pivot there. And then um, evolving customer preferences. So customers are a lot more socially active. They're wanting an omni-channel approach. And I think the biggest thing I take away from it is everything needs to be digital. Um, and we've, we, we've seen it as Genesis with the, the COVID situation is that a lot of potential customers out there have to have digital capabilities. Um, and there's a lot of engagement from, from that perspective. So for me, the innovation that are required then demand a specific focus on some key priorities or areas. Um, and again, I think I'm, I'm mentioning COVID again, but I think the uncertainty requires focus on these different areas. So I think firstly, real-time response, which it allows a very fast response to your end consumer. Hassle-free claims, you know, we're selling the promise of a claim being paid. So how do we streamline that? Immediate answers about cover, are they covered? And I think globally, we've seen a lot of questions around business interruption. Um, 
Then insurance as a utility. So it's maybe a slightly different terminology to maybe what you, some of you are used to, but it's, it's really a pays you use or pays you need type of insurance cover. But I think also importantly, rewarding positive behavior. <clears throat> so if we can drive risk mitigation and reward that, there's, there's benefit across the, 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 across the space. Crisis proof processes. Um, so al allowing policyholders and giving them the reinsurance, the, the reassurance that they're covered and they can access critical engagement services when they need to. I think also driving, you know, some of the COVID type scenarios. And then I think really importantly, caring partnership, um, making sure that customers feel empathy from you as an insurer um, and, and insurance companies. And then I've spoken a lot about it, but digital experience, being able to provide a really great mechanism for customers to engage digitally um, at all the various different points in the value chain. So being able to quote and buy, be able to claim, be able to track claims, be able to make changes. So I, I think it's a, it's a good list of some key focus areas or priorities to focus on when you're looking at adopting um, InsureTech. If I translate that, maybe into some uh, actual actual things. I think the first bit is the digital experiences and including a wow factor. I think what we've also seen is a lot of customers are used to the retail space where the experience is great and it's been able to try and build that into the insurance space. Internal efficiencies, being able to support that in a very efficient ways at the end of the day, reducing cost streamlining uh, or, or creating streamlined and transparent engagement points, agility, which I've mentioned, innovation of digital products, but very much hyper-personalization, um, being able to provide customers exactly what they want based on life stages that they're in, and trying to do all of this at a reduced cost at, and provide the customers the, the value at the, at, at the end of the day. So then what I'd like to then do is move on to the what, so, um, you know, in order, in order to satisfy the why, what do we need to do from a, an insurtech perspective and a technology adoption perspective? So I, I, I see that the, the insurance value chain is split into three key different, different areas. There's the enablers, there's the distributors and the full carriers. So from an enabler perspective, Technology and data is definitely dominating the current um, insure tech space um, and leveraging things like AI, data science, predictive modeling. And a lot of that uh, in, in Europe and in the US at the moment takes up 51% of where the insure tech focus is at the moment. Um, on the distribution space, it's around creating marketplaces for customers to purchase product. Comparison, comparison websites, giving them options about different, different covers they can take up. The B2B and the B2C space from a broker perspective. And that in the insurtech space again is constituting about 80% of the distribution models in the US at the moment, being able to facilitate those different types of engagements. And then the full, full carrier side is to drive price down from you know, being able to provide customers out there the right product um, the, at the right price um, and driving very much a, a fresh uh, distribution type, type capability. So again, I think to expand on the what, it's for me about creating ecosystems um, where you in, you're incorporating and integrating all of these different technologies throughout the value chain. It's about creating customer centricity, being able to understand your customer, being able to offer them multiple different covers, driving and facilitating a single view of customer. It's obviously the data enrichment bits, which we've spoken about, which is the AI and the machine learning capabilities. Um, then product agility, being able to configure products um, given the requirements that you need quickly, get that out. Um, then enabling di new distribution channels, um, specifically around digital. And then as I've mentioned, embedding insurance in products, um, which ties into the, the, dif the different distribution channel. I've, I've always said that in order to innovate, or, or to, to innovate within insurance and to innovate a product, you, you need four key areas. You, you need an innovative product, 
um, being able to actually identify what that is and define it and design it. You need a technology capability to support it, um, the ability to actually distribute it and get it out there. Thirdly, you, you need a carrier to back you or an insurer to actually believe in the product and, and back it. But I think the biggest challenge that a lot of us face is distribution and how do you get that distribution out there? And that's through social networks, it's through um, affinity partners. Um, so I think there's a lot of, of, of um, some good things that can be done around the distribution channels. Right, and then if I, if I move into the how, um, you know, insurers, I think have very varying different adoption styles uh, out there. And you saw some of that in the, in the PwC video. There's the wait and see approach. There's the incubating from on the side of the business to enable innovation, or there's the ability to really embrace change from the ground up. So how do we, how do we go about adopting these, these different changes? Um, so this slide was, a uh, I think positioned it quite nicely is that you've, you know, you've got the ability, various different routes to enable true innovation. Um, and for me, there's three different options of how you go about doing that. You can build it, you can buy it, or you can collaborate with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with other aspects in the, in the ecosystem. So I think the table quite nicely shows the factors that help you arrive at a decision. And potentially there's, initial phase um, and then later phases. So, you know, potentially initially you, you go straight with time is really important. So you collaborate and then at a later stage you build. Um, but I thought I'd include this because I think it does really show um, factors that may influence your decision on the route you move forward. M my view uh, is creating this ecosystem approach where you use and take these beneficial te pardon me, technologies and use them where they're needed. Um, but what, what any of, of these capabilities require is an insurance management solution that has what we term open architecture or APIs to allow you to integrate these various technologies um, into your core backend platforms um, and, and integrate where, where needed. So uh, th this slide then I think just takes that approach a little bit further where you're looking at an inventive insurer in the top right um, along the top of the table, you're looking at what, you know, what do you do now? What do you do? What do you do as new? What do you do next? Driving a lot of the trends I've spoken about, hyper-personalization, smart AI-driven processes, continuous code in, uh, innovation. Um, and then driving, again, product agility, open ecosystems, intelligent processes, as well as customer centricity. And I think the, the, the diagram shows quite nicely um, what parts you can do from a collaboration perspective, what you can do from a buyer perspective, um, what you can do from a, a build perspective. So hopefully that gives some insight into, into the how um, and you know, how best uh, do, 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 should companies adopt change from an innovation perspective and how they, how they innovate. And then what I'd, what I'd like to do next is then just highlight some of some actual practical examples of insurtechs and where they've added a lot of value. Um, so, so this slide talks to some that have really made it to what I guess what we call the, the unicorn status, um, comparing it to an Airbnb or an Uber approach, um, where they've over time got to a point where they valued at a billion US. Um, so, so Root is, is really interesting. Root is a, a motor insurer disrupting the motor insurance space. Um, and it's very much about um, driving behavior, um, being able to understand how, how um, a, the millennial market actually drives and then based on their on-road habits, price differently, mitigate risk. Um, and they've had obviously some, some great traction. I think the, the other one is, is Lemonade, um, which I think most of you would know. Um, they've had a lot of, a lot of uh, press around uh, their, their launch. Um, they started, funny enough, to target the millennial consumer, um, which they still are, um, but started looking at how do they put a charity uh, slant to the covers that they offer, and almost a friendship type of, of approach, but again, very much targeting 
um, a different market, the millennial market, but also leveraging a lot of technology behind the scenes to automatically pay claims. And I think they were one of the first um, insurers to pay a claim in a number of seconds based on using AI methodologies and machine learning methodologies. Um, Clover is also an interesting one, so more in the health and life space, but it's very much driving, um, leveraging health monitoring tools to drive preventative care. So it's very, I guess, aligned a lot to um, my comments earlier around risk mitigation. Um, HIPPO, which is is not not the HIPPO that we we know in South Africa, but HIPPO in the US, and and they've they've taken the IoT approach or the sensor type approach where they've allowed customers to actually mitigate their own risks. Things like flat cover, door sensors, smart CCTV type capabilities. Again, they're driving down potential claims, um, allowing their customers to, to, to manage that um, and offering them this innovative product uh, in very much a, a digital manner, but having the ability to warn customers when they're potentially at risk, leveraging big data capabilities. <laughs> And then Zonglan in from China is taking very much a full digital approach. Um, so, so obviously the, the consumer base is massive, um, but providing a full digital straight through process capability to allow customers to uh, engage fully in a digital manner, being able to quote and buy new policies, manage claims online, um, and re massive reduction in, in overhead to actually maintain this massive and large customer base. So I think it's some great examples of, of uh, potential customers out there that have, or well, uh, companies out there that have leveraged technology where it made sense and deploy um, these innovative uh, capabilities. Um, and yeah, then the, the last little bit I want to, want to go through then is just to showcase um, some others and, and some of these I've actually had um, personal engagement with, um, so I can, I can talk to that, but um, so some that I really believe is has looked at technologies out there and said, how do we how do we use this to change the the insurance industry? Um, so Flock is a, a really interesting um, insurance company that started out using technology and very much driven based on the invent of drones. So so they are a, a drone insurer, but again they very much took the approach of risk mitigation. Um, being able to educate customers um, from, from their app to say, you know, are there any dangerous obstacles around where they're flying? But then more importantly, a, a pay-as-you-fly type insurance. And they've had globally a, a huge take up um, from customers out there being able to have this kind of on-demand type cover con in conjunction with this risk mitigation aspect. Um, Make You Safe is a, a technology used um, a lot in the large uh, industrial sectors as well as mining. And what they've done is they've built a, a Fitbit type device um, that employers would put you know, on, their, on their arms. And it's about then being able to have the ability to um, identify potential uh, hazards within the workplace and mitigate uh, workers' compensation claims. Um, so being able to identify before someone gets into a dangerous position or exposure, um, and again, very much driving this, this, um, this risk mitigation aspect. Um, then Zago is really focusing on the gig economy and the self-employed and entrepreneur type space. And what, what we've seen um, is that a, a lot of workforces are moving into this kind of consulting space where you've got a lot of these um, kind of consultants and they need a lot of um, insurance. Um, so it's, it's very much a case of being able to provide tailored insurance to the sector that they're working in, um, covering them um, completely via an app. So again, a, a, a very digital low engagement model. Um, Extract is, is really an interesting one. Um, I'm, I met them in London and they, they actually came out of a telematics man manufacturing space where they um, built a lot of telematics devices for vehicles. But the gap they identified in the market was that currently a telematics graph at a, claim, at, claims, at a claims point is a spike graph that is very difficult for anybody really to read. 
So what they did is they trans they actually went out and crashed a whole lot of cars uh, over a period and measured telematics information. And they've created a capability to provide a very visual view on what happened at the scene of an accident, kind of overexposed on Google Maps. So you can replay the incident, see where the vehicle was driving, what impact happened on, on the vehicle, leveraging other data enrichment services like Autodex to calculate the estimated cost of replacement or if it's repairable, um, as well as a lot of fraud management. Um, so we, we've done quite a bit of work with them integrating that, which adds a lot of value um, from a, uh, you know, a motor claims management perspective. Um, Dengue is, is also a, a kind of pay by the second insurer. Um, and again, dry, aiming at the freelancer business. So we, we've seen a lot of uh, insurtech starting up in that space and they've had some great, great traction. Um, Inverse is a little bit different. So I think different in the, in the value chain. So they are around facilitating payment gateway integrations. So typically what we found is depending on which country you're operating in and what type of payment options you want to provide, you need to integrate to various different payment gateways. And what Inverse has done is they've done all of that heavy lifting. You integrate to them once and they actually can then facilitate any type of payment integration, be it PayPal, be it Apple Pay, be it different banking uh, mechanisms. But more importantly, what they, what they do is they drive down the cost because every payment has a transactional cost. So depending on your volume, depending on the price of your premium, they'll direct it to different payment gateways to drive down that, that cost. So really quite an interesting uh, uh, company to watch. Then NEOS, I think some of you may have, uh, have heard of them. So, so they, they actually started providing smart CCTV cameras where you can just plug it in and it connects to your Wi-Fi. And you've got a great app on your phone and you can monitor what's happening in different areas of your property. But they took that idea and then they pivoted to providing insurance. And using that technology, they actually know exactly what risk they're insuring. They can start identifying if there's people in your house when there shouldn't be. So again, risk mitigation. And more recently, they've expanded into smoke detection as well as uh, water leakage and flood detection. So they've, they've gone the approach of, you know, build out this technology that gives customer benefit. I, I actually have, uh, have a few in my house and I use it all, you know, pretty much every day seeing what's going on. But then you've obviously got the massive benefit of going the, the insurance route off that. Um, and yeah, then I think the uh, Relay is a, is a good example of a reinsurance collaboration type platform, um, leveraging a distributed ledger, be, ledger behind the scenes. And this is the, the benefit I really see here is the ability for carriers uh, and reinsurers and different uh, role players within the value chain to be able to share data in an unmanipulative uh, manner that the data can't be changed and be able to understand exactly what's on cover, where and, where and how. And then I think finally, um, another one that, that I've worked quite closely with is, is Data Warp or the data company. Um, and really what they've, they've done is they've gone and built out capabilities to identify claims fraud. Um, so essentially taking all the information about the policy, about the broker, about the claim, the vehicle, the repairs, and triaging all of that information to create a universe of engagement points. And then running that through a lot of scoring mechanisms to provide the ability to almost green, amber, red flag a claim to say, is there a possible, is there possible fraud or not? Um, they go even further into things like social media interactions. And I think the one use case we, we, we still joked about was the customer was claiming for a personal accident injury, but the next day on social media, he's jet skiing on a beach somewhere. Um, and it's those kinds of things that with accessing all of this big data, you've got the ability to kind of bring that all together and leverage, you know, machine learning AI to be able to identify that proactively. Um, so yeah, so I, I, was, I was hoping just to give you a, a high level view of, of some of the, the innovative insurtechs I see out there. And um, yeah, hopefully what I went through was insightful. Um, and uh, yeah, Daryl, maybe we can, we can jump into a couple of questions. Yeah, thanks Craig, that was excellent. Um, We've got a couple of questions. I'd also like to ask a question from my side. Um, if I had just looked internationally at some of these um, insurance insurance tech, insurance companies that are tech based, <clears throat> I 
a lot of them have raised a heck of a lot of capital. Um, they've got some pretty decent solvency. They've got great brands, but arguably none of them have really started turning and showing profits yet. Um, if you just yeah. look at the sort of net positions, just what's your view on that? And, and I mean, what's the, what's the sort of from a technological perspective, uh, what do you think are the timelines, you know, from when a tech insurer starts to, you know, start seeing profit and starts turning in that hockey stick because that hockey stick seems incredibly long um, in the cost cycle. Um, so that's just my one question to you. Um, yeah, maybe start with that and then we'll, we'll move on to one or two from the, from the, from the received uh, questions. Yeah. So, so, so Darren, my, my, my views is, I, I think twofold. I think there is the aspect of distribution, which I mentioned in the presentation of being able to secure a trusted distribution channel. Um, and I think a lot of, um, a lot of our local insure techs have struggled to, to get that distribution. Um, so I think it's about the trust of the brand. Um, and I think what has helped is actually getting large insurer backing behind some of those insure tech startups because it creates that credibility. Um, I also do think the other aspect of it is market readiness. Um, so, you know, globally, uh, individuals would buy the insurance from an online capability and that's what they used to. Um, there's obviously lots of value in the intermediary space, especially on the more complex risks. Um, but so I, I would put it down to the two aspects of, you know, brand awareness and distribution. And then secondly, um, I guess, is the, is the market ready for this kind of disruption? And it's often very much a case of there's a, a sweet period or time period to actually introduce some of this disruptive tech. If you do it too soon, it actually backfires. If you do it later, you're behind the curve. Sure, sure. And I assume you need you need volume. I mean, you really need proper volume, I think, for this to 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 turn the profitable um, corner. Yeah. And secondly, I think maybe the jury is also still out in terms of how efficient long term is a digital claims validation cycle. Um, you know, arguably different markets have higher fraud propensities than others. You know, it's based on, you know, various social factors. Um, but I think the jury's probably still out in terms of loss ratios of some of these digital players long term, um, specifically in markets where you see a higher fraud element, um, yeah. where sometimes, you know, that filter of, of eyeballing a client um, on red flag, on red, on red flag type claims. Um, I mean, if, if you don't have the ability to do that, I assume it's obviously going to impact the loss ratio, you know, quite drastically. So that's, that's probably something, something to watch, it's specifically in some of these American tech insurers where some of those loss ratios are still pretty, pretty high. Yeah, um, lemonade is an example. It's early days. <laughs> it's early days. It's early days. That's exciting stuff. We've got a comment also from from Lucy, um, where, where she congratulates you on the informative presentation, and she also makes the the, the great point of of you know intermediaries are key in this entire sort of value chain. Um, and if the intermediary adopts it, then it's a you know, it's a good solution to the end to the end user being the policyholder. Um, but she makes the comment also about just, you know, the point, the, the use of IT being important for certain other, other segments in the supply chain, like your loss adjusters um, and other service providers. Um, just what's your view, Craig, in terms of as a tech provider, you know, when do you think we'll start seeing a more integrated supply chain um, on these digital platforms? Because arguably, you know, a lot of the pressure points, I think, in the market aren't really necessarily within the brokerage or within the insurer's control. It's often within the procurement space. Yeah. After you know, the after the the claim has been approved, so to speak, you know you've got this open work item sitting with an independent entity or specialist that's licensed to do that work. Mm. Um, and I guess how do you just integrate that at scale? You know that entire ecosystem and keeps the the client and the broker front and center. Maybe yeah. just your thinking of where the market's going with that. Yeah, so 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 Darren, I think I think that's probably the biggest pain point. You know, an insurer can provide cover; he can authorize the claim. Um, but it's actually then up the, the experience that the end user gets is him actually getting the repair done or getting the, you know, but basically relying on the supplier to do that. And that's an insurer supplier. So I, I think it's definitely an area where there's a lot of improvement uh, needed. Um, our, our approach has been to, to integrate into um, capabilities and platforms out there that tie up those 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 suppliers um, but it is a challenge because they all use different systems it's a very it's a very complicated integration area um, but we, we we have used some specifically in South Africa we've used some local suppliers that have have brought that together and then we've we've, we've integrated that from that ecosystem perspective I was talking about earlier so that as a 
loss adjuster or an assessor is appointed, they get it, all the information electronically, they can go out, they can do an electronic assessment, that information automatically flows back into the platform, starts adjusting estimates so you can manage it from that perspective also do kind of CSI scoring afterwards to see is the is, is their customer satisfaction, um, which then assists in reappointment of those. So, but, but absolutely, I think from a procurement management perspective, it is a challenge. Um, I do think that there's technology out there that can solve it, but it's very much about the adoption from the various different suppliers. Sure, sure. And then just one more question, um, which, is, which is a good one. Um, it, it, it mentions how it's interesting how many of these technologies that the insure techs are using creates an advantage, however, or a competitive advantage. However, many are not being adapted or adopted or sort of taken up by, by traditional insurers, mm -hmm. um, except for telematics, which we know sort of globally is, is getting a lot yeah. more penetration. Just what's your view on why insurers have been slow to take advantage of some of the insure tech available? So, so I, I think there's probably two, two, two main areas. I think there, there is the just innovative culture within the insurers, but I do think a lot of the insurers out there see the benefits in it. Um, quite a few conversations I've been part of though, is there is this potential risk of cannibalizing existing revenue streams. So, so if, if, if I take an example, if you had to take a large insurer and they have a large motor book that's relatively performing all right. Uh, you know, their premiums are, high, are, are highish, but loss, there's, there's, there's obviously concern around loss ratio. If they had to introduce a pay-as-you-use or a usage-based type motor insurance, are they not cannibalizing their own, um, their own existing revenue stream? So I think there is that type of concern. Um, I, I do think that there's opportunity in the greenfield space for insurers to actually say, look, let's maybe launch another brand um, that innovates products that doesn't impact too much of the existing. Yeah. No, thanks. On that note, I would just like to again thanks Genesis for, for the time and the opportunity today in, uh, in addressing the, the IG market. Thank you for the presentation and just all the work that went into it, Craig and, and to Crystal. Um, and on that note, we, uh, we wish everyone a brilliant rest of the uh, week ahead. Thank you very much.